You're listening to The Crypt and I would like to welcome Jeff Jerome to the show. Jeff is the former curator of the Poe House and Museum in Baltimore and he's here today to talk all about American author and poet Edgar Allan Poe. So you're very welcome to the show, Jeff. Well, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to share my knowledge uh, about Edgar Allan Poe with your audience. Fantastic. I'm really looking forward to hearing all about him now. Well, firstly, Poe was remembered for his tales of terror and haunting poetry, and today he's considered the inventor of the modern detective story and innovator of the science fiction genre. He had quite a tragic life, so I want to go right back to the beginning to Poe's childhood. Well, of course, that's a good place to start with Poe. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe was born in Boston. His mother and father were in the acting profession, which wasn't a very honorable profession in that time period. His father vanished. We have no idea what happened to him, uh, leaving a young wife and uh, three children. And uh, Poe's mother uh, died leaving the three children. She had tuberculosis. And uh, uh, his brother Henry was adopted by the Poe family in Baltimore, Rosalie, his sister, was adopted by the Mackenzies in Richmond, Virginia, and Poe was taken in uh, by the Allen family, never legally adopted. It's so tragic, though, like three siblings split up like that at an early age. Well, it, it's uh, the life expectancy for people in that time period was uh, pretty tragic. Uh, and apparently it was the custom in that time period when someone would die leaving children, people would step up and adopt the children or take the child or children into uh, the family. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, John Allen and his wife apparently could not have children. So uh, Mrs. Allen uh, was friends with uh, Poe's mother. And when she died, you could almost hear her say to her husband, Oh, John, please, we must take in this small child. Uh, You know, I will love him like a son. Please, please. And he relented and took him in, but never legally adopted him. And then could you talk then about Poe's education and the financial struggles he went through during college? Well, John Allen uh, apparently did the best he could when Poe was a young child. But as Poe got older, uh, Poe began to realize that his stepfather was, uh, how can I say this delicately, was uh, uh, fooling around with other women. And he had a number of illegitimate children. So when Poe found out about this, the two of them started to grate each other. It it seemed like... uh, John Allen was realizing that Poe was aware of these things and and he just didn't want Poe around. So he sent Poe to the University of Virginia, which was a new college, and this is where the wealthy people, the aristocrats, sent their sons. Well, this is what is really tragic about this. When Poe was in college, he excelled. While other students were fighting and getting into trouble, Poe was doing what he was supposed to be doing, and that was getting an education. But John Allen sent him to college without any money. Poe had no money for books, clothing, no money for the basic necessities like soap and for food. So Poe gambled, and he lost. He got ripped off to the tune of about $2,000, which was a huge sum in that time period. Now, if this was any other son of an aristocrat, The father would just write a check, pay it, and say, don't do it again. But John Allen berated him, called him uh, that he was wasting his time in college, and removed him after the first semester. He never gave Poe a chance. That is terrible, especially when he was, you know, doing so well, and it all just came down to money. Oh, it, 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 it does. But in that time period, you I guess like today, you had to pay for everything. You You needed clothing, you needed soap, you needed books. Everything had an expense to it. And here's poor Poe sitting with all of these rich kids, and he had no money. So he did what he thought was a good idea, and he gambled. And that's the only time in his life that he gambled, and he got ripped off. Boy, did he get ripped off. After leaving college then, he returned home to find his fiancée was engaged to somebody else. Well, this is, uh, I mean, poor Poe, he just couldn't get a break. (laughs) 
he had a uh, a sweetheart in Richmond. Her name was uh, Elmira, and uh, when he went away to college, they promised to keep in touch. Well, Elmira's father knew that Poe was not the legal son of John Allen, which meant that Poe was not uh, included in any inheritance. Yeah. So Elmira's fa- father was intercepting his letters. So poor Elmira was sitting and waiting and waiting to hear from her her boyfriend, Edgar. And when she received nothing, she just assumed that he was no longer interested. And while he was away, she became engaged to a wealthy uh, Richmond merchant. And I'm sure the marriage was arranged through her father. So when Poe came home, he was devastated. And you can just imagine what Elmira thought when she found out that he was writing her all along, writing all these letters that she never received. So right up to this stage, all the men in Poe's life were all absent. (laughs) We're we're really absent. John Allen was not uh, a loving father. Then at 18, he published his first book and he joined the army. Well, he thought, uh, I guess, being a a young, uh, uh, being a teenager, uh, he wanted to get out of the Allen household because he was no longer wanted. John Allen made that very clear. So he joined the army, uh, and this was amazing. He achieved the rank of sergeant major, which was the highest rank you could achieve yeah. in a peacetime army. Not only that, but he was what was called the artificer. He was the guy responsible for making the bombs. You needed knowledge of chemistry, physics, uh, algebra, because you wanted the bomb to explode over the enemy, not in your cannon. So it was a very, it was probably the most dangerous occupation you could have in the army. And it just showed the level of intelligence he had. But he didn't want to stay in the army. I think he just got bored with the routine. So he did, which was legal at the time period, he paid someone to take his place in the army and he left the service. And then he suffered the terrible loss of the only mother he'd ever known, Francis. Yeah, yeah, his his stepmom, she really loved him. She uh, doted after him and she interceded on his behalf when John Allen didn't want to send him money or, or, or whatever. So uh, when, when he returned home, he missed her funeral. She was already buried in the ground the day before he arrived home. And he was devastated, didn't have a chance to say goodbye. And once she died, John Allen uh, began to distance himself uh, from Poe. And there was nothing keeping him from uh, kicking Poe out of the house. Well, that was it, because Francis was the only one, I suppose, shown shown him any kind of affection at all. Yes, yes, and uh, poor Poe, it, it seems like most of the women that he loved or loved him died tragically from uh, tuberculosis. His, uh, his mother died of tuberculosis, and uh, Francis had tuberculosis. His wife uh, later died of tuberculosis. He just couldn't get a break. <laughs> he just could not get a break in life. Poe returned to home to his father's town of Baltimore, broke and alone, and then he found a new mother figure with his aunt Maria Clem, and then his cousin Virginia became the object of his affection. I was quite stunned now. She was quite young, Virginia. Well, <laughs> let's, let's just backtrack for a second. Uh, we're leaving out West Point. Okay. Very important. Uh, Poe joined, uh, or he went to West Point thinking that because of his previous army experience and his college experience that he could go through West Point in about a year. Mm -hmm. Well, that was laughable. But when you join the service, you don't dictate the terms. (laughs) They they tell you, you are here for four years. So again, like the army, while he was there, he excelled. He was at the top of his class, but he said West Point is no place for a poor man. So uh, he wanted out, and the only way he could get out of West Point was to neglect his duties. And that's what he did. He neglected his duties. He just didn't do anything, and they had no choice but to expel him. But it wasn't because of drinking or gambling or bad behavior. He just didn't show up. He just walked out of West Point. At that point, he came to Baltimore. 
and that's where he uh, found Maria Clem, as you mentioned, and his brother Henry, and his two cousins, Virginia and Henry. And he uh, joined that household, and Maria Clem took him in as if he was her son. There are two locations in Baltimore where he lived. Uh, when he returned in the late 1820s, he lived in a town, part of town now called Little Italy. That house was torn down in the 1920s. Uh, from that house, they moved to what we now call the Poe House Museum, mm -hmm. which is at number three Amity Street. And that was in the western outskirts of the city. Now, at that time, his brother Henry had uh, died of tuberculosis. So in that house, he was living with his aunt, Maria Clem, uh, his cousin, Virginia, and his cousin, Henry. And this was approximately 1832 to 1835. Now, what makes this time period so important is it was in this house that Poe discovered the public's fascination with the bizarre, mm -hmm. the strange, the unusual. He was writing poetry but not making any money, and he was uh, looking for inspiration. And he did what many writers today do, and that is they read through the newspaper looking for ideas. And he read an article about people being buried alive accidentally. Yeah. And the light bulb went off in his head, and he wrote his first true horror story called Berenice, mm -hmm. written right here in Baltimore. And it was a gruesome tale of premature burial, grave desecration, mutilation. Well, it was a fun story. Well, <laughs> the public didn't think it was so much fun. <laughs> and uh, there were many complaints about the subject matter. And he was forced to censor his own story. He took out several paragraphs that were just too gruesome. And he promised never again to write a story like Berenice, which he did because that's what we wanted to read. Could you tell us about his time at Messenger Magazine? Well, for Baltimore, uh, his grandmother was paying the rent. When she died, the family had to move. So, uh, on behalf of a friend in Baltimore, he received a job in Richmond, Virginia, on the Messenger, uh, a, a magazine. And uh, he actually did quite well there. He increased the circulation tremendously, but unfortunately, oh gosh, unfortunately, Poe uh, was drinking, mm -hmm. and uh, and the owner of the Messenger had no choice but to uh, let him go reluctantly because the uh, because of uh, Poe's uh, contributions to the magazine, it became one of the top magazines in the country. But Poe, uh, for whatever reason, was feeling depressed, sad. Uh, he, he turned to the bottle, and uh, he had no choice but to release him. He moved to New York. Could you talk a bit about his time there and the death of Virginia? She also got tuberculosis, didn't she? Well, she started coughing blood when she was uh, 16 years old. Uh, doctors were predicting her death at age uh, 18. Uh, she actually lingered until age 24 when she died. Uh, they were married uh, in Richmond. She was 13. He was 27. Uh, now, before everyone starts saying, oh, my God, that's terrible. You can't apply today's values to a time period when things were drastically different. In the 1820s and 1830s, the life expectancy of a young woman was around 25 years. You had to marry young. You had to start at a young age having babies because most of the babies died. Uh, no one was really upset about the age difference. They were upset that they were both poor. Normally, when cousins got married, it was for money, to keep the money in the right family, the right religion, right social class. They had no money, so people thought, why did they get married? Well, they loved each other, pure and simple. There was nothing perverse or strange in their relationship. So while they were in New York, Poe's career was it was doing okay. He wasn't making a lot of money, but he was being published. Uh, he was writing poetry. And uh, then Virginia's health started to deteriorate uh, to the point where if she would raise her voice, she would start coughing blood. And many people would drown in their own blood from tuberculosis. So each time she would have this attack, 
Poe just couldn't handle it, and he would just have a breakdown. He loved her so much, but there was nothing anyone could do with someone who was dying from tuberculosis. So she died in 1847, and uh, at that point, Poe was, uh, oh, what's the right word? Poe was not, uh, not acting strange, but obviously he was very upset over her death. And uh, I think he tried to find uh, the love of another woman, which is not unusual. But uh, he suffered through her death, and uh, I don't think he ever really got over it. And sure, he'd suffered so much loss in his life. It's like every woman he ever loved, he lost them. Exactly, and it, it's just so sad uh, that he had to go through that. Now, let me let me just at this point tell people that many people think that uh, the Raven. Let's talk about the Raven yeah. for a, a, a quick second. Uh, the world's most perfectly constructed poem. People think that Poe wrote that in honor of Virginia. Well, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but that's not true. Uh, Virginia died in 1847, and The Raven was published in 1845. And Poe never really tells us why he wrote certain stories, but he did tell us that he wrote The Raven for the express purpose of running. Now, I don't mean like running down the street, but he wanted to write something that was so sensational, so noticed that whenever people would read it, they would immediately think of Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah. And it worked. His nickname became The Raven. So the idea that Poe wrote The Raven in honor of Virginia or in honor of someone else that he knew really isn't true. It, it's, it's, he wrote it because he wanted to make a name for himself. And there are many different versions of The Raven. Uh, uh, I believe there are nine different versions. And when he died, he before he died, he wrote to a friend saying that he was not happy with it, that he was still working on it. And that's amazing. Like I said, it's considered the world's most perfectly constructed poem. But he did it to make a name for himself. And it's amazing as well, the fact all these years later, like it's one of the most famous poems ever. But and, he and got paid he, so little for that, didn't he? Uh, he was paid, depending on who you want to believe, he was either paid $7 or $14. Uh, so he became famous. He became an overnight sensation. And the Raven was, people couldn't get enough of it. I mean, people knew about Poe, but this poem put him on the map. Everybody was talking about it. People were having nightmares about it. Uh, whenever there was a storm and there was a tapping on the shutters, people would jump mm -hmm. and go look at the, open the window and see what was there. It had that kind of impact on people. It made Poe famous, but it did not make him any money. Did he meet up with an old flame at that point? Well, after Virginia's death, uh, he became involved with this uh, woman poet in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, Sarah Helen Whitman. And I think from looking at the way they both acted, I think it was more infatuation than love. They were both poets. And when they met in Providence, they, they looked each other in the eyes and you could see the sparks flying. Yeah. But I don't think it was love. I think they were just both taken with each other. And it got to a point where neither one of them thought, hey, I, I don't. You know, I don't want to get married now. So Poe, they were engaged, and uh, Poe, I think, purposely broke off the engagement, and he went his way, she went her way. But the funny thing is, after Poe's death, uh, Sarah Helen Whitman became one of his most staunchest defenders. Uh, she spent the rest of his of her life defending Poe against the character assassination and the rumors and gossip that were being spread about him. Uh, Poe uh, went to Richmond, where he became reacquainted with his childhood sweetheart. And she was a widow, and, uh, and you could almost imagine when they first saw each, each other, the old feelings came back. Mm -hmm. the, the fire was rekindled in their hearts, and uh, they became uh, engaged. And here's where it really goes downhill completely for Poe. Uh, when he left Richmond to uh, return to New York to uh, get Maria Clem 
bring her back to Richmond for the wedding. He stopped off in Baltimore uh, to catch the train uh, to Philadelphia, then New York. And this is where the this is where the mystery of Poe's death happens. He disappears for several days. We don't know what happened to him. Uh, they find him outside of a an, an election polling place wearing someone else's clothing. It was ripped, soiled. It didn't fit him. He was incoherent, so he was recognized. The family was called, uh, and they took him to the nearest hospital where he spent the next several days in and out of delirium. Then he died October 7th without explaining what had happened to him. Now, let's let's backtrack a second to uh, when he comes to Baltimore. He comes to Baltimore, like I said, to continue his journey north. Disappears, we don't know what happened to him. He is then found wearing the different clothing. The current theory and the most plausible theory is that Poe was a victim of cooping, that's C-O-O-P-I-N-G, this was a, uh, uh, a political kidnapping where if you were running for office and it was election time in Baltimore, you would hire the police or thugs. They would go out and kidnap people, sailors, uh, people that were just walking on the street, and they would give you drugged alcohol and coop you up in a building, and they would use you as a repeat voter. Now, to confuse the election judge, they would maybe change your clothing, shave off your sideburns or your mustache, and they would use you to to vote again and again. And when you couldn't vote anymore, they would dump you out on the street, and that's where we find Poe. But there are also 22 other theories concerning his death. That must be so infuriating, though. Do you know when you're such a big fan of him and not to know? It it is. It, It really is. Uh, but there's one way of looking at this. If Poe had to die, I'm glad it was in Baltimore because he was recognized by family. They knew who he was. He received care, and when he died, they buried him in his grandfather's plot uh, in the old Westminster graveyard. If Poe had died on the train or in Philadelphia, he had no identification. Nobody knew who he was. And we would be sitting here right now talking about where the mystery he? of where Poe's body is. Yeah. Do you know, it's so sad as well to think that he was going back to get married and he might have actually found the happiness he was looking for. And this happens well, and before he gets the chance. Not only that, but he had a job offer to edit a newspaper with no strings attached. Oh. He always wanted to, to edit a newspaper, and but he usually worked for nincompoops, people who didn't know what they were doing. Uh, so here, a, a job offer, no strings attached, engaged to his childhood sweetheart. My goodness, things were looking up for Poe. And he dies in Baltimore. Unfair, totally unfair. Yeah, truly tragic. And for anybody who's listening now who'll be unfamiliar with Poe, could you name like some of his most famous works and kind of the main themes that it appear throughout them? Sure, sure. Uh, some of his most famous tales are The Telltale Heart, a story about uh, superstition, uh, murder, uh, the black cat, another tale of superstition and uh, 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 spousal abuse, animal abuse, uh, the fall of the house of Usher, a tale of perverse insanity. Uh, but before people start thinking that all Poe did was to write horror stories, let me correct that right now. Poe also wrote comedies. He wrote science fiction. He wrote about traveling to the moon in a balloon, which people thought was impossible. So his science fiction did not go over too well. He wrote uh, what many people consider to be the first detective stories. He was a poet, literary critic, uh, newspaper publisher, uh, and he wrote horror stories. It's just that we like to be scared. We want to read about things like people being buried alive and people being, you know, tortured and murdered. Poe did not like writing horror stories. He did it because that's what we wanted. And let's face it, we haven't changed, have we? One of the most, yeah, one of the most popular genres today is horror yeah. films. So Poe tried to do other things with his career, but we remember him for his 
tales of terror and, and horror. Were you always a fan of Poe? Oh, my my interest in Poe goes way, way, way back with the old Vincent Price, Roger Corman films yeah. uh, in the early 60s. And I was just a little tyke at that time. And uh, uh, we went to the local movie theater. And unfortunately, I was too young to see these movies because at that time they also had a rating system. And you had to be uh, at least 16 years old to see these films. So I, I, I will not share with you how I got into the movie theater, <laughs> but my brother helped me. And here I was, just this little boy, sitting and looking up at the big screen with Vincent Price going crazy with the Poe uh-huh. stories. And that was my first introduction to Poe, and I was hooked. I couldn't get enough of Poe. But it wasn't until many, many years later uh, actually, during the Baltimore Bicentennial, 1976, that I that my interest in Poe was rekindled. Yeah. I became a tour guide at the Westminster Graveyard and eventually made my way to the Poe House. And at that time, it was managed privately, and the city of Baltimore took control of the house in 1979 and asked me to be the uh, first curator. And I was there since 1979 until... 2013. You must have absolutely loved that job. Oh, I hated it. I couldn't stand it. No, I'm, I'm joking, of course. <laughs> it was the best job I ever had. I had so much fun, and you never knew who was walking through the door. Yeah. And one day, uh, Vincent Price was in town uh, doing a play at the local uh, theater, and uh, I was invited backstage, and here I was standing oh at, looking at Vincent Price, and the only thing that came out of my mouth was, uh, oh, uh, yeah. and he sensed that I was nervous, and he started talking about baking bread. And after five minutes, we were like best friends. Oh, that is I so took amazing. him to the graveyard, I took him to the house, and uh, but it was really, I, I don't consider it a job. I just had so much fun. I'd working at the Poe House. That little boy inside of you that remembered watching that film on the big screen and to be standing there talking to the great Vincent Price, oh my God, it must have been so amazing. Well, that's why I couldn't say anything. I felt oh. so stupid. Oh, I had all mean. these questions. That, and and he, he sensed that. He knew it. And he just like took me by the hand and, and broke broke my shyness. And we just started talking and we, we couldn't shut up. We just kept going on. Oh, that is fantastic. Absolutely. Well, look, Jeff, it has been so fascinating having you on. I really enjoyed hearing all about Edgar. And as I said, I've, I've done so much reading and there's so many different versions of the story. It's great to hear it from somebody who has such a great passion for him, like yourself. Well, well, thank you. I really enjoyed this. And, and I hope I, uh, I interested some of your uh, listeners in uh, reading more about Poe and reading his stories. I think you will, most definitely. Thanks a million, Jeff. Thank you.